yeah, just for those that are joining us now, we are recording the webinar, so it will be available um, on the website afterwards for anybody who hasn't been able to make it along tonight. Um, so starting off then, huge thanks to Sharon for being with us here tonight. Uh, for anyone who isn't aware, um, Professor Sharon Madigan is the Head of Nutrition for the Sport Island Institute and she looks after all of the Team Island athletes. So everyone who was going out to Tokyo there last summer. Um, really knowledgeable in this area, um, nutrition and energy availability. It's a really huge and important topic, particularly for a sport like rowing, where the demands are so high. So we did a questionnaire, a survey there last summer that some of you might have answered um, around energy availability in our female athletes. And that's what's kicked off um, the interest in this area. So we'll be looking at the results in this as we go through as well. But it is, um, this is for males and females. It, it's not just for females. So I'm going to hand over to Sharon, but just before I do very briefly at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey going out as well. It's just a little bit of feedback so we um, can take what we've learned from this evening and maybe adapt to what we do in the future. Um, so there is a lot to get through. So off you go, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne, and uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you, everybody, for giving up your evening um, to come to tonight. I'm just going to share my screen, which hopefully will get um, going. I think everybody can see that, can't they? Yeah. Leanne, could you just, can yeah, you see, can that? see that? Yeah. Oh, here we go. We need to go back to the beginning. <laughs> There's always a problem at the beginning. Sorry. Okay, um, so this evening we're going to um, probably um, look at quite a lot of things and, and kind of what I want you to maybe think about is that um, you're going to come into this presentation tonight with a lot of ideas and thoughts and I suppose baggage is a really good um, way of putting it. We all do, we all eat and drink, therefore we have our own preconceived ideas about what is what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. I want you to go away tonight thinking or feeling that there's maybe a couple of things that is slightly different to what you might have thought. And also what I'd like you to think about is reflect on this because there's going to be lots of things that you'll hear and um, probably maybe, um, I suppose, disagree with, and that's actually a good thing. Um, but also that there's always a context to this and that's going to be the big word um, of this evening. So I think that's really important. Um, and I suppose in terms of performance nutrition, the main aim really is um, to allow athletes to train and compete as well as possible, as well as giving them the nu enough nutrients for daily life and really to support an active lifestyle. And, and you have to remember where you're coming from in rowing, particularly of all the sports that I work with, this is very different to Joe Public. So the advice and the recommendations and the stuff that you hear regarding nutrition and what we're looking at is very different um, in, um, I suppose, in um, sport nutrition than it is for Joe Public as well. And it can mean different things to different people, depending on your requirements, your training status, underlying medical conditions, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I suppose, again, um, what I'm looking to do, oh, why has that decided that it doesn't wanna come down? Ooh. Yeah. Um, for me, sports nutrition is context dependent. And what I mean by that is, no athlete is the same. Um, the training load isn't the same. The training experience isn't the same. And that's really, really important because we cannot be judging ourselves against somebody who's been in a program for five years, three years, 10 years um, versus somebody who's just come into something very, very recently. So it's really very, very it has to be set in context. Um, gender and body size is very different. And again, our, our males and females will be slightly different. Our heavyweights um, and our lightweights are going to be different. We have personal preferences. We have personal abilities, choices, knowledge, cooking abilities, all of these things that come into um, play a big role here as well. Um, again, in context, is it in or off season? Um, and what is the purpose with the single workout or the single training session? So we've got to look at that. That context is really important. 
and I, I have to say fantastic questions that have been sent in by everybody that um, you know registered tonight. I hope to be able to um, answer most of those during the context of the session, but there will be some at the end and, and clearly you're very welcome to ask questions as well. But one of the big words that kind of threads through a lot of the questions is healthy. Um, what's a healthy way of achieving this? What's a healthy um, snack idea? What's a healthy um, protein source? What's a healthy carbohydrate source? First of all, I'm, I'm going to bring that word into context as well, because I think this is really, really important because it actually takes our eye off the ball um, when it comes to what we're trying to do in a sport like rowing. And in terms of the definition of healthy, it's a good physical and mental condition to be in good health. And again, that is actually very different in different contexts. So if I was to see somebody with type two diabetes that was 20 stone, that never exercised, that was eating all the rubbish of the day, the advice that I would be giving to that individual would be completely different to the advice that I'll be given to our rowers. If I have a boxer that's trying to make um, 52 kilos, 60 kilos, um, that's in a very explosive, high intensity, short duration training type, very high intensity, but not the same endurance that you do, it will be very different. So what's healthy for um, Joe Public, what's healthy for that individual with type two diabetes or overweight, and what's healthy for a rower are really very different. And what I would have to say is that taking or trying to apply some of the healthy messages for the general public actually can put rowers at serious risk of physical problems and also in terms of mental health problems as well. And when we define context, context involves the many factors that influence a person's life. And if you guys are training twice a day, six days a week, that's a massive influence in your life. And we have got to take that and put it front and center in terms of what we do as well. Um, this is a, a, a diagram from one of our walls in the Institute. And really um, it comes from a conversation that I had a co with a coach many, many years ago where he, uh, we had an athlete who had very low iron. And his solution was, oh, that iron, that athlete needs an iron infusion. And my question to him was, what is the, where is the problem? Why is the iron low? And the reality there is if there's a hole in the bucket, you're not going to ever resolve that problem. So you've got to go back to basics and ensure that you keep your bucket full, that you keep you full in terms of your body. Um, and that will help in terms of your sleep, your nutrition, your recovery. And then that will allow you to do your training. It will allow you to do your schoolwork or work if you're at work or college. And it will also allow you to deal with the stressors in terms of everyday life and also in terms of your, your sport and training as well. So what do you want in terms of athletes and what do coaches want as well? Well, clearly performance is key. Um, we certainly don't, and, and coming from my background, fundamentally a healthy athlete is a, a well and a good performing athlete. And if we don't have health and well-being as your um, bedrock, it, you will not be able to sustain this in the long term. We want to get the training adaptation and by allowing yourselves to get that we will get that competition performance as well. So this is really what we're trying to achieve day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. It is that consistency that is really, really crucial there as well. And the reality is they have actually done research on those that have won Olympic medals. And when they look at it, those that win the most medals are those that are the athletes that are injured the least and are not sick. That's what it comes down to. It is a very fundamental part of allowing you to train consistently for a long period of time. So why is navigation of this particular tightrope really difficult? Why um, you know, do we find that it's really, really crucial or hard for athletes to try and do that? And this is one of the, the bits where I would love to be in the room with you all um, because I would be asking this question. Well, the fundamental thing is that 
there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. It can be because um, people, you know, decide that they want to increase their training load without eating. Um, there's an unintentional mismatch of energy. Um, maybe people have decided that they want to change their body composition and go the wrong way about that. There's lots of reasons. And I would urge you to have a look at maybe some of the evidence that's out there and is becoming more evident which is great because I I think the power of the athlete voice is amazing in trying to um you know unearth and demystify some of the issues that's there and this is this guy he's actually a triathlete he went to college um some of the things that he did was he he increased his training load um things were going really really well first off which is always an interesting thing and from a coaching point of view, I would I would just be really alarm bells should ring for a little while there. If it continues on, great. But sometimes there can be actually a period where things are absolutely flying before the wheels come off the bus um, after that. And again, he wore his constant exhaustion badge as a badge of honor. Um, and then what happened was he was diagnosed. We had extreme fatigue, um, constant bad moods, um, dramatic and visible weight loss, loss of libido, all sorts of things there. And again, he was diagnosed then with REDS. And part of his problem was that um, some of his hormones were exceptionally low, and that can also lead to, to bone injuries as well. Um, this is another athlete where, again, coming down to weight, um, where this individual was too thin for their own good as well. And, and there are lots of similar stories um, where fundamentally people have gone about this the wrong way and maybe used weight as a factor that they need, they feel they need to change, but actually um, that's possibly the wrong way about going about it. So what is this low energy availability? Basically it leads to low everything. That's the reality fundamentally. Um, and, and it eventually will catch people out. Um, and unfortunately, from my point of view, I probably see people at the other end of this at the worst case scenario. So again, tonight is about making sure that you don't need to come and see me or you don't need to come and see people like me. Um, you may not take all of the things here as something that's applicable to you, but hopefully there'll be some nuggets in here that you can use beneficially as well. And what are some of the signs of underfueling? A lot of them are very nondescript and that's the problem. And it's only when athletes and coaches reflect after there's been a massive problem that they start to say, my goodness, maybe the signs were there, but we actually put them down to other things. So we've got musculoskeletal injuries, niggles, bits and pieces. Um, gastrointestinal is actually an interesting one because people start to complain, bloating, wind, pain, maybe diarrhea, constipation. Um, people are in bad form. Um, mood is not good. We get bone injuries, and again, um, the risk of rib stress fractures and rowing particularly high. We get changes in hormones, and actually it's changes in these hormones then that can lead to issues with bone health and for females, um, metabolic function. Um, and, and again, the metabolic bit is actually, it's harder to make weight if you're a lightweight particularly, but it's also harder to get the body composition and particularly the lean mass that you're looking for as well. So there's a range of different things there. Some people present with lots of colds and um, sniffles and stuff like that. Uh, lots of people, uh, females start to notice that their menstrual cycle stops or actually goes out from a normal 28, 29 day cycle, maybe out to 40, 50 days. They are red flags, start to listen to them. Females are probably lucky in that they have that and men and boys don't have this particular, I suppose, warning um, function and they are probably much more nondescript there. And when we talk about this energy equation, really, we're looking at the energy balance, the relationship between the energy in um, and the energy out. And we often find this very difficult to balance this because this word calories is seen as some kind of fear factor. Um, in the general public, where everybody's talking about keeping them lower, et cetera, et cetera. This is not something that we need to be looking at when we are training twice a day, 
every day or six days a week, certainly as well. So what, what is this used for? And, and again, art was never one of my strong points, but this is a, what I'm trying to explain to you of, of what happens here. And again, this is why I wish I was in a room with you. We have our fuel tank, which is what we eat and drink. We have our training load, and that's movement of all sorts. So it's training, walking the dog, walking to school, uh, cycling to school, cycling to work, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have all these other things that go on below the level of the skin. So how you're feeling generally, your bone health, your immunity. We could put hormones in here. We could put bloods. We could put soft tissue. We could put every, the list goes on. So when we look to decide which one of these tanks does fuel, uh, you know, go to first, you know, if I was there in the room with you, I'd be saying to you, do you think that any one of them is more important than the other? Well, actually, the reality is that training or locomotion actually will be number one. And it's a kind of an evolutionary thing. If there's, you know, a big lion standing behind you and it's going to eat you, you need to move. You need to get to safety because the reality is if you're dead, none of the rest of these matter, to be brutally honest. So what you're hoping is that there's enough in the pot for the training and then all of these other tanks or, you know, physiological um, functions get a little bit of the fueling um, as well. Now, if training goes up and fuel stays the same, and I'll show you in a minute how that can happen, um, because it can happen very easily, then what we have a situation there is not only do what these guys here get is reduced or stopped, but actually any reserves that are in these particular pots actually might have to go in to support this training load. So when people say to me, I have been doing this for weeks or months or years and there's been no problems, that doesn't really surprise me either because the body will have a facility where it can support that, an overdraft facility for want of a better word, but eventually that starts to run down as well. And again, we start to see things happening. People say to me, well, which one of these goes first? And that's where we're all very different. People present sometimes with these constant colds. Other people present with some niggly stress, bony stress reactions, et cetera. Um, other people, their iron gets really low. Um, other people, we start to see um, you know, fatigue, maybe niggles in terms of soft tissue. So it's all very individual. And again, if we look at the length of time, this is kind of an example of our energy balance. And the reality is the longer you spend underneath that curve, right, the more likely you are to suffer a couple of different problems. So if you're under that period of time for a, a long period of time in the day, well, then in terms of females, uh, you're much more likely to have bigger amounts of body fat and harder for that to shift. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. And again, in males, the longer you spend below this curve, then um, actually the chances are that you're going to end up with an injury. Um, and the reality is, if you think about it, okay, let's say um, you decide you want to get up on a Saturday morning to do a session. And if you're lucky, your energy balance is here. You know, you've ate late the night before and you've managed to keep it above that. But the reality is, it's probably a little bit below the line when you get up in the morning. You decide you don't want to eat breakfast before training. Bingo, down it goes, downhill. So you're training down here, right? Then you have a little bit of a, a snack or a meal or a first breakfast um, before you go to your second session. And down we go again um, after that. And it might be a small session, maybe. And then we have a big feed if we're lucky. And we're lucky enough now to bring it above the line. And we stay above there, but then we meet our friends or then we go and do something else. We walk the dog or we might go for a cycle or whatever. And boom, down it goes again. We might have something else. It hasn't reached the top of the line. Down it goes again. And when we're going to bed, we're still below the line. And guess what? Remember, Sunday's here. We're going out to do something again, but you're going to go downhill 
when you're sleeping at night. So where are you going to start Sunday? Well, um, probably below the line as well. And if we look at this example here, just, and you know, this is what I would like you to do, guys, because this is such an easy way of you to look at where the pressure points are in your week, right? And if we can deal with the pressure points and the periods of time, then what we can do is we can actually, oh, sorry, um, we can actually um, work back from that. So what do I mean by pressure points in, in terms of, of this? So look at Saturday and Sunday here. So this individual um, has some fruit salad and yogurt before they get onto the water. Um, they do an erg session on the Saturday morning and then they meet their friends. They might have a little bit of hot chocolate and cake, whatever, then they have their dinner, etc. But what I want you to look at is if we look at periods of time, from 9 a.m. on Saturday till 1.30, 1 1.10, 1 1.15 on Sunday, you've actually done one, two, three, three, four sessions. So in just over 27, 28 hours, whoever's good at maths here, one, two, three, four sessions. Do you think this individual has prepped in this day? Probably not. They certainly haven't been able to replenish the cost of this. This hasn't prepped them for it. We'll talk about this in a little minute because this is an aerobic um, endurance session and this individual's focusing primarily on protein, wrong nutrient, wrong time. Sandwich is great there. Um, again, bit of a delay um, after having that. Again, okay, good source of carbohydrate, but a massive gap then through the day. So um, fuel sources is going to go downhill. And the chances are the person is really below the level of the curve um, here. And what I want you to also look at is let's look at Sunday to Monday, because the Sunday is your preparation for Monday. So somebody has their big roast dinner on a Sunday here at one o'clock. They have some fruit and then they have something like French toast um, at 6.30 in the evening. They have nothing else. But on Monday morning, they are now going to do a bit of gym and run as part of their aerobic session. So from 6.30 on Sunday um, till just after their session here, this is the first time they eat probably at around about eight o'clock and again, wrong fuel in the tank after the wrong session. So can you see how suddenly now, when somebody's doing a session somewhere around here, the wheels are gonna come off the bus. Your ability to do these sessions consistently is gonna be really affected and they're not going to be as good as they could be. So what are some of the barriers to this? High intensity exercise has an acute suppressive effect on appetite. So after this, these sessions here, the chances are you actually can feel sick. You don't feel hungry. And most of us, hunger is our driver for eating. In these scenarios, we have got to eat, and that could be liquid um, solutions. So again, things like yogurt mixed with milk, uh, banana thrown in there, oats, maybe some, um, you know, powdered nuts and seeds, blend the whole thing up together. And what you have there is a meal replacement that can be used both before and after you come out of the boat as well. Your increased energy expenditure um, due to high intensity exercise. So what can happen is the hunger can be affected for a period of time, depending on who the individual is. And look at the days there. Most days you are doing something. So you're not going to have a chance to actually come back from that. So it's really important to look at our training sessions as our drivers, as opposed to that's when we eat. Lack of time. You are in a sport which is time costly um, and you're time poor. Um, school, college, training you have a life, you may play another sport. So you can see that that becomes a real acute barrier to this. Um, your frequency of meals need to go literally through the roof. Um, it, it is 
the hardest bit. Like you'll see some of the videos later, but it is very, very tricky to do. And again, this is where low energy density foods start to become a real problem. So if I see athletes on Instagram or whatever, posting pictures of, you know, they've been out on the water for whatever, they've been running 10K and there's this beautiful um, plate of rocket and tomatoes and lots of lovely salad leaves, etc. The reality is that is nutrient dense, but it's energy poor. So you're now starting to get into what is now known as this energy deficiency or energy imbalance. So it is a real um, seesaw here. And the quantity of food needs to reflect how much you're doing. So this is where it probably needs to change during the week and also actually during the day, depending on, on what you're doing. So, um, you know, I would be saying double dinners Saturday and Sunday there for those big sessions and possibly Friday and Monday needs to look it in and um, depending on what you're doing on some of those days as well. So I'm just gonna play a video from one of my colleagues here. And this is, the reality is for some athletes here, we're looking at somewhere in the region of Actually, for most athletes, we're looking in the region of four to five and a half thousand calories. And I just want to show you what that looks like in terms of foods and then what that looks like in, in terms of snacks, etc. Oh, sorry. Hey, guys. I'm talking to one of the performance nutritionists here at the Sport Ireland Institute. And um, today what we're going to show you is what five and a half thousand calories looks like in terms of day to day eating. Um, and we'll, we'll whittle it down. So these will make multiples of uh, recipes, but we'll whittle it down into what an actual day looks like on a plate for you in time. So David, I'm just looking to see in terms of how this would, uh, how easy this might be in terms of, you know, rowers putting this together for, um, being out and about, um, training maybe a couple of times in the day, and also things like um, how easy it is to digest, because I think that's been a barrier for some rowers to be able to um, consume a lot of this as well. Yeah, so like it's, it's all about, I suppose, plan, planning and preparation, taking the opportunities that you have in the kitchen to pull together extra recipes and meals for, for the week. In terms of that kind of in the boat and on the slip type thing, and um, we will make like a granola bar, a breakfast bar, but you know, simple stuff that you can buy in a shop and say like jellies that will pack a huge amount of carbohydrates into fuel the session, which you know in that bowl there you have the same amount as is in a French toast and, and banana topping. So this hundred grams here of jellies is the equivalent of having that bread, the milk, the banana. Yeah, and both those are topped with like maple syrup and honey. So. Yeah. So the reality is, in terms of having this in a boat versus this. Yeah, much more manageable if it's a pack of okay. jellies. Um, sure. In terms of things like just dental health, which would be a concern mm -hmm. sometimes, how would you, any protection against that? Well, I suppose like what we're looking at there is just not sugar being your sole source of, of nutrients um, constantly, but you know, from time to time, in the diet is perfectly fine. You'll see we will have things like your honey built into other recipes, um, but because there's other nutrients, we'd say in your proteins from your, your yogurt and your um, milk and some fruit there, that'll help with reducing the, the impact that the honey would have on dental health, as an example. Other things that you could do to help with that are things like water and yeah. also sugar-free gum, potentially, as well. Yeah, just getting the turnover of saliva in okay. that. Um, so you're going to put this together over the next wee while and show us what this looks like in real life, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. The okay. Fun, the fun begins now. Okay, so we'll see you in a wee bit. <laughs> so we have uh, prepared all the meals and the snacks for a full day of eating. And what you see here now in front of us is 5,500, 6,000 calories. Um, a nice mixed bag, so head out the door in the morning and we have a couple of slices of banana bread which are loaded with um, some nut butter and jam and a couple of that with a smoothie which you can drink on your way to the Roman centre and um, you know a, a snack while you're out in the water it might be the likes of a breakfast bar that you've made up and you can batch out or it could be jellies, 
for me, a couple of cookies as an example, uh, just handy things that you can throw into the pocket and bring with you. Um, lunch then, fajitas, um, making sure to add in the likes of the cheese, the guacamole, and a couple of wraps because they're the bits that add up. They don't necessarily take extra um, bulk, but they, they add extra energy and calories into your day and help them to support your high energy demands. A couple of snacks then across the day, so you have your French toast topped with banana, all um, adding in extra either honey or maple syrup. So again, increasing the, the carbohydrate content of the meal. Another one being pre bedtime, maybe having the likes of a, um, an overnight oats or soaked oats in a jar or a granola pot and um, smoothie, and then evening time it might be like a baked pasta dish. Um, again, coupled with a smoothie where you can get extra calories in to meet your energy needs. So I suppose this is <laughs> Pretty much in terms of like, doesn't matter what size or build you are, who you are. And I know Sharon was chatting to me here about Lydia, and one of the pieces that she was, was commenting on was the amount of energy that she needs in the day. So she needs nearly 3,000 calories just to cover her training demands. And so it doesn't matter if you're a, a large male or a small female or in between, and you need a huge amount of energy, and that's pretty much. Okay, so um, I think that gives us a bit of a flavour for the volume of food, and that's the tricky bit. And if you speak to any rowers, it becomes the bit that's the, the hardest to, um, to manage. And um, the reality is, it is we've got to look at energy dense foods as well as nutrient rich. We, we've got to understand what the difference between that is. And if we just come to some of the results that we found over um, the survey that um, you completed um, in terms of screening, and this was really done with our females. Um, we don't have the ability yet to screen our males um, yet, but that will come. Um, is it an issue? And, and I suppose these are the results that we have here, um, if I can if it works. So um, the aim really was to identify what the prevalence of um, low energy availability in female rowers are. Um, we sent out the Leaf Q questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire. Um, and we wanted, what it does is it covers injury history, gastroenter, um, GI issues, and also menstrual function. Um, you had to be above 18 years old, regularly active at least two and a half hours per week. And we excluded anybody who were pregnant, um, chronic issues. And we probably, um, anybody over the age of around 45, we probably needed to um, exclude due to the, um, the area of either perimenopause or menopause as well. And really a score of eight indicates that there is a risk um, of uh, low energy availability. Um, so the respondents was fantastic. We had 87 respondents um, in total. Um, we did have a few people, the minimum age was 18, the maximum age was um, 67. Um, we did have to uh, exclude those due to the um, confined, confounding factors of being menopausal. Um, but what you can see here is, um, at risk of low energy availability is 41 athletes or 47% um, of the group. Um, and what, what you would have to, and if when we took out anybody over 45, we had, we had 69 or 32 that were at risk. Now, what you notice here, and this is a very interesting point, is that those that have a higher BMI, now we don't know what that is, we don't know if that's muscle mass or we don't know what that is. So the, the reality of what we have seen and what I see in practice quite a bit is that people who perceive their body shape or where they're at in terms of weight not to be where they want, they are potentially at a bigger risk because what they do is they go to reducing food intake is the, as the way of changing their body composition and it's just so not the way it is absolutely 
please take from this, there are better ways to do this. We can actually achieve far better um, body physicality by eating to train rather than starving yourself. That's the message I really want you to take home um, tonight. And if we look at what the risk is in Ireland overall with females, and this was a group of a thousand females from a range of different sports, we're looking at about 40%. So we're not far off the mark in what the, the reality is um, overall in, in a much bigger cohort as well. But look at what the risks are if for those that were at risk where the injuries are. We're looking at muscular injuries, we're looking at ligament injuries, and we're looking at stress factors. And that's a really significant part of this as well. Um, so out of that group, these are the kind of injuries that we're presenting, particularly in those individuals that may have been um, risk versus not at risk. And, and this is interesting because these are the dietary patterns. So in that bigger group, we had 47% of uh, athletes following low carbohydrate diets. We had 41% following a gluten-free diet. We had 21% following a dairy-free diet and we had 17% following a paleo diet. So there's very good evidence to suggest that low carbohydrates is actually very much linked to bone injuries. And we're actually in the process of a, a PhD project looking at this very thing. Most people know that dairy in this part of the world is a big contributor to calcium. We get it from other things, absolutely. But the reality is, if we were to compare a piece of cheese versus spinach, we would have to probably have a bag of spinach to give you the same quantity of calcium. So yes, there are some of our green veg that's very good source, but there's quite a lot. You have to eat quite a lot of it. Does people know that actually the, most, the second most important source of calcium in our diet is actually from fortified uh, white flour? So once we start to remove bread and also other uh, flour products from our diet, we remove the second most important source of calcium out of our diet. So if somebody decides that they're going to follow a gluten-free diet and a dairy-free diet, I would have to ask them where they think they're going to get sources of calcium. And that's really very important in terms of things like particularly in bone health and particularly um, uh, for both males and females. So do uh, seek help uh, professionally if you are going to if you have to look at this. Now, some people with um, gut issues do find that they are um, finding their symptoms are improved on a gluten free diet. It's actually not the gluten that's the problem. It's actually the wheat. So uh, when you buy gluten-free products, you actually get wheat-free, but you need to look at that as a different issue. That is nothing to do with the gluten. It is more a wheat sensitivity rather than a gluten sensitivity. And it's due to how the wheat is, is absorbed. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is we had a lot of questions. We tried to group them into different areas. Um, and what I'm going to go through are those particular areas now at the moment. And one of the big areas were those athletes that are following a vegetarian and vegan um, diet. And absolutely, there's no reason that people can't achieve good performance in this. They may have to work a little bit harder. One of the big questions was how were they going to achieve their protein intake? Um, the reality is from a vegetarian point of view, if you're having um, cheese, milk, protein, or uh, yogurts, um, you will be getting eggs, really good sources of protein there as well. If you're a vegan, you will have to work a little bit harder, but remember there's also protein from things like oats, bread, um, and other vegetables, or, or sorry, um, cereal and vegetable sources as well. The overall balance and the optimization of nutrition is really important. So. Let's try and put that into the context of getting 5,000 calories a day. This is the bit we have to really focus in. How easy is that going to be when you think of how nutrient rich a vegetarian diet is, but quite often how energy poor it is. And that's something that you guys need to reflect on and see how you add extra calories into your diet as well. Other nutrients that we do need to be mindful of are iron, calcium, 
omega-3 and B12, particularly those on a, a, a vegan diet because they need to be supplemented. This here is an example of a, um, a, an iron fish, would you believe? People thought I was messing with them. Um, iron deficiency anemia is one of the biggest public health concerns in the world, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, and really, we used to get a lot of our iron actually from using iron cooking vessels. Um, and that's actually where the Guinness story came from as well, but we now store Guinness in aluminium, so we don't get the iron from it, unfortunately, for some. Um, but this here guy works in that you put him into water, um, the iron leaches out into the water, and actually then you can use your water then in cooking, in drinking, making um, various hot drinks, um, making smoothies, etc. cetera. Um, so that is actually a way that has been shown to be successful and might be an option for people who struggle with taking oral iron in the term of supplements as well. More preparation is often required and some nutrients will definitely require supplementation for vegans. I would add in vitamin D there as well. And the big issue and the big concern for me is the lack of calories overall, the struggles that some athletes have, and actually, some athletes then struggle with GI issues as well because their fiber intake is quite significant. Um, so it is something that you need to be mindful about. Um, lightweight rowing, um, I think the fear of trying to make weight needs to change. I think if you feel well, if you give the process time, and this does take a little bit of time, um, it will work. And I will listen to Lydia later and, and she can hopefully convince us of that. If you fuel your training, you will be able to work hard more consistently. You will not get sick. You will not get injured. You will not lose any days to, to training. You will make weight much better. So that it, is, it is a process. You may wobble at times, especially if your weight goes up. But remember, we have to get all the bits and pieces underneath the, the skin sorted out first, almost like the hormones, all of those things, because they play a big role in changing our body composition. We also need to consider things like growth spurts um, and look at that across time. Um, and again, I would get support here in trying to do that. What about teenagers? Uh, there's one area, bone health, bone health, bone health, bone health. We pay into our bone pension up until the age of about 19 or 20. That is it. You know, we can make small adjustments to improvement, but we really want those bones to be as strong and as dense as they possibly can be. This is a bone that we that looks good. This is a bone that's weakened. It actually, to me, if you look at a crunchy, when you break it open and you suck the middle of it, that's what a bone that actually is weak in the middle. It's much more easy to fracture um, and break. So we don't want that scenario as well. Um, calcium, vitamin D, protein, um, energy availability, and carbohydrate is actually crucial in, in terms of bone health as well. Iron, significant numbers of, of teenagers have low iron levels because we're not able to store it as well. And this becomes much harder when we start taking out food groups. So when we start to take out um, our better sources of iron, that becomes an issue as well. Um, time, study, training, life, access to food, picky eaters, beliefs around what to eat and not eat, all of these things play a big role. Context is key. It really is. Um, I have a 15 year old at the moment who's proceeding to tell me all about um, whey protein. Um, I did have to ask him, did he know what I did at, at some point? So the reality is there, there's going to be lots of messages out there for teenagers. Um, they got to understand that they've got to put it in their context. How much you need will depend on the training load, but can vary from about 3,000 to 5,000 plus calories, depending on whether you're female, male, whether you're having a growth spurt. Um, preparation is key. We can't afford these big gaps in the day, and it's very hard to claw that back over the course of the week. Listen to your body. Red flags will appear, and we do need to listen to what they might be if you're not feeling well enough. And again, risk factors for low bone density, many hours of training through rowing, um, having a low body weight or a BMI, having low muscle mass, 
if we have menstrual dysfunction in females, that's going to be a risk factor. And if we've had a history of a stress fracture, um, a fatigue fracture or a stress reaction, that certainly is a risk factor as well. And, and certainly if I've got athletes that have one or more um, stress fractures, I'm looking at a DEXA scan to see um, where we're at there. Me, a females, we do have a female webinar, which you can access. And again, that will give you a better in-depth into a lot of the areas there. No period, it's not normal. Um, first stop is to assess your fuel for training load. Do not consider, you know, there needs to be a really good reason why somebody should be put on the pill as a first step to try and normalize it because it's not a period it's a withdrawal bleed. So that is not the way to go about that. Assess why this might be happening. Again, I'm coming back to bone health. It's really important. Iron's crucial. And again, if there's problems with guts, if there's problems with your menstrual cycle, these are definite red flags in terms of low energy availability as well. For our master's rower, as we get older, Iron and calcium become really important again to try and, um, uh, I suppose, maintain our bone health. Protein is important because it'll help with our bone health as well. We need to look to ensure that we have sufficient strength training incorporated into your training mix, not just the air, not just on the water. Our muscle declines with age actually in our 30s. Um, so weight training will actually help to maintain and sustain your muscle mass, which is really important. Not enough carbs around training will also lead to muscle losses around your aerobic sessions. It will not help with recovery and you will be unable to sustain higher output sessions over the course of the week. Do that seven day diary. Look at where your um, pressure points are in the week. Look at your other commitments, your family life, your work, whether you're running here, there or everywhere, whether you're trying to jam a session into the week just because you have a bit of time. Is that the right way of doing it? Because it might knock you on at a later stage. Postmenopausal risks for females, particularly after the menopause, because they have been protected with estrogen um, and lower iron levels, would you believe, up to that more than males. But would you believe actually one of the blood results that we look at when we're looking at low energy availability is our cholesterol levels. When there's not enough energy circulating in the blood, um, the liver releases cholesterol as a fuel source. And what happens is we have higher circulating blood uh, lipid levels. So uh, lots of people come to me, particularly the weekend warriors, older athletes and go, I really don't understand. I'm training hard. I eat really well, but my cholesterol levels are, are sky high. And actually, yes, maybe there's a familial thing there, but we can reduce those levels relatively quickly if we get that feeling right as well. Um, more training may not be better. And again, um, look at how you set up your week is really important as well. The type of fuel, this comes down really to carbohydrates are the fuel of choice. And that is the reality for an endurance sport. And carbohydrates are, are really the devil's spawn at the moment. Fats will be used, but you need carbohydrates when the intensity increases. Protein is key for recovery, but it's not a fuel. If you're using protein, there's a problem. Your sessions, you'll be much sore the next day. And to access protein, you break down muscle to access that protein. And guess what? It's driven back into the liver to be converted into carbohydrate so that you can do your high intensity sport. Don't demonize nutrients or food, particularly carbohydrates. Absolutely, some of us can consume too much sugar at certain times. But the reality is that um, if you're training at this level, we need to consider how we're going to get the calories in in certain ways as well. And if we are increasing these, we need to look at our dental health needs, the type and the frequency of the carbohydrate intakes. Um, you know, look at uh, water and, and milk to help protect your teeth. Uh, look at straws um, uh, to help pass the fluid beyond the level of the teeth. And also a small amount of sugar-free gum can actually increase saliva production, which can protect your teeth as well. It's interesting because we're actually about to start a project with the dental hospital to help us um, really come up with um, 
you know, some solutions to some of the the difficulties that we achieve here and trying to achieve one or the other. Um, different stages of training and of life will require adaptation to this, but, you know, it's sugar-free options might actually be worse, particularly for your guts. And again, some rowers have guts of steel, um, but others haven't. So watching that fiber piece is really important there as well. Supplements, um, very popular, but you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? My friend's taken something, therefore I take it as well. That's not, that's not the way to go about this. Question I would have to ask is, why is there such a focus on protein when rowing is an endurance sport? Lots of questions about protein. Um, and the reality is you're putting the wrong fuel into the tank at the wrong time. If you're just focusing on protein, you're missing a trick. So we do need it. It needs to be in there for recovery, but it needs to be in there with carbohydrate as well. And quite often a meal replacement is a much more useful strategy to deal with it, particularly in our inter or double training sessions. Um, we can have oats, we can have yogurt, we can have fruit, we can have milk, we can have seeds, we can have nuts, blend the whole thing up. And we now actually achieve our calories. We achieve our protein through yogurt and milk. Uh, we achieve some of our micronutrients through fruit. Uh, we achieve more carbohydrate through oats, yogurt, and milk. And we get some of our fats and protein from nuts and seeds as well. So you can see we're actually killing five or six birds with one stone by looking at that as well. You need to look at the basics. You saw what the other athlete was doing there and they weren't getting the basics right. If you get the basics right, absolutely, uh, supplements can be useful, but you really should look at what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, it's not a sticky plaster approach. Some supplements really are really necessary from a public health point of view. Vitamin D potentially through the winter, folic acid for females of childbearing age, um, but you know, or a deficiency. And again, if we're um, struggling with things like calcium, then we need to look at how we get that back into um, the diet as well. Um, training and competition. Use training as your dry runs. Actually, practice your competition strategies in training. Breakfast should always be what you will do a competition. It will fuel the training and you're comfortable with it. Remember, nerves slow di digestion. So make things, use things that are easier to consume. So for example, you might be quite happy most mornings to eat Weetabix or shredded wheat or, you know, big bowl of porridge or oats, but actually on a competition day, that might not work. So your meal replacement might work easier or actually things like cornflakes or Rice Krispies, less fiber, easier to digest. And again, it will give you the carbohydrate that you need. Um, this is where you add in shakes to add calories, which are very useful pre and post race um, in and out of the boat, which is important. High in carbs, low in fiber and fat. And I say these for both lightweights and heavyweights because the reality is if you get this right, your ability to make weight will be much easier as well. What do you do in the boat for long training sessions? I would like to see you ensuring that you're fueling during those long training sessions so that you start ahead of the curve. Think about when the petrol tank's really low and you have to stand at the petrol station for a long period of time to fill it up. And when your petrol tank is half full, it takes a lot longer or shorter to replenish that as well. The night and the day before is part of your racing routine. If you have bloating, pain, or changes in your bowel habits around racing, then you need to look at potential solutions to that, and you may need to seek out help there too. Stick to your usual routine in the week leading up to your race, and what your taper will do was actually introduce a carbohydrate load. So you shouldn't be doing any major changes around that as well. And just to come to the end of this, you know, it is difficult. And this is a piece of work that um, uh, our team led out um, last year where we actually took a group of athletes and took a group of coaches and actually asked them how difficult it was and, and what they understood about this message around eating more food for health and performance, which is real counterintuitive. The initial thoughts really, oh, the penny dropping. Um, I've done hard training blocks. blocks. I've thought that it, 
I was eating enough calories for a long time, but I have not, you know, thought about it before. So it's unintentional. People don't think about this. A lot of shock, actually shocked a little bit. I knew I had to eat more, but I didn't think it had to be that much. Um, and this is a real one here. I think I was a bit scared because I didn't think I needed to eat more. I thought that I was eating a lot and I was worried I would put on weight. This is actually the one thing that you won't do if you do it right. And if you follow the process, you actually will gain strength. You will become a much stronger athlete. Your endurance will be much better. You will be healthier and you'll be less li likely to get injured. Um, some of the benefits of fueling. There's a lot more quality coming from each session. I wasn't, I was going through the motion. I wasn't going through the motions as much, more quality and more focused, I guess. I just have the energy available to do it. This was a coach. Having athletes who are healthy to train every day consistently is for me the biggest beneficial part of this. One of the key things was we were always trying to get across to our athletes. If you're not available to train due to illness or sickness, then it doesn't matter if you're as strong as an ox in the gym. That's the one thing that's going to um, let you down. And again, some of the barriers or challenges that we talked about earlier, the actual time to eat enough can be very difficult. The windows are small um, post-training. Um, if you're training twice a day, it's even shorter. Um, it's difficult to eat. It's difficult to combine that with work or study. There's not a lot of time. When people commit... Um, to this way of eating, sometimes they can put on weight before they lose it. And that's complex. So you need to stick with the process. You will wobble, that's my opinion, but you need to remember that this is not an overnight solution. It takes a little bit of time because you're trying um, to get the system uh, over, you need to get the whole system back on track again. So there are some perceptions, again, that endurance athletes who don't have a period, that's normal. Um, it's not something that we that should be a warning sign. Um, it's accepted as being part of an endurance athlete. That's not the case. Um, a lot of medics will put young girls on the pill to bring it back. It's not a period. It's a withdrawal bleed. So that's completely off kilter as well. So long as that's been identified as the problem, but a good history will identify that as well. From my experience, we don't have a problem with athletes not eating healthily. They eat very healthily. And then, if anything, they eat too healthily. I think there is, that's why I don't like these words, because I think, the, again, what's the context? I think that there is an issue of social media and Instagram and general body image, and it is very difficult for people to get away from this. Young athletes are very influenced by what they see online as opposed to what they are told and unfortunately, it is a hard thing to show. So what I would say is you're committed to certain patterns of behavior because they've actually helped you in the past. This is how behavior works. You, you think, oh, I did that. I really had a good race that day. I had a PB, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what has happened is things have changed. Your behaviors have now become more harmful than helpful. And the reason why you can't move forward is you're trying to commit or apply the old formula to something that's new in your life I had a runner on the other day whose training load has moved up from 65 miles a week to 85 miles a week she's still trying to do the same thing and training has gone to pot so you've got to change the formula to get a different result you can't continue with the same pattern so I'm going to finish with context before we come back to the um, uh, to uh, Phil and to Lydia. A rib stress fracture is not healthy. Loss of your period is not healthy. Not maximizing your bone density is not healthy. Getting the cold frequently or um, other immune issues is not healthy. Stressing about food is not healthy. It's not the enemy, it is your friend. Eating too little can actually be very unhealthy. We see changes in blood, immunity, and injury risk. For me, that is not healthy. You can be light and strong and healthy, but you can also be light and not strong and not healthy. Be mindful of dental health. We can use strategies to look for that. Um, and we need to just be mindful that 
everybody's going to be different here. This is the difficulty with speaking to, you know, over 300 odd people. Everybody's going to take a slightly different slant from this as well. This is, you know, we have lots of our own rowers here that could have said exactly the same thing, but this is a really nice piece from this, the New Zealand context. Um, how their rowers at more and triumphed. And actually, would you believe this is something that they took from us? <laughs> um, and we have been very successful in achieving really healthy rowers. It takes time, it takes a process, um, and there's wobbles. And actually, it's not something that stands still. And you'll be able to see Phil talking about that in a little while as well. It's actually really, really difficult um, to get this right as well. And what I would say just about this is, you know, we use these educational sessions as a way to improve athletes' dietary behavior, to try and improve your knowledge. Remember, knowledge doesn't always translate into improved dietary practices and sustained behavior change. So we really need to look at how the messages we get across to you tonight can look to, to go down that route, because that's really, really important for me um, in terms of health and performance as well. Um, because remember, health and success is not what you can see. On Instagram, this lad here would look fantastic um, because he looks great from the outside, but there ain't a lot going on below the level of the, the surface here. This lad here doesn't look great, but look how strong um, it is below the level of the surface of, of, and I want that same message for you guys here tonight. And I think hopefully um, Phil and Lydia can put a little bit of that in context for us as well. Okay, Phil, thank you for joining us um, today. Just maybe to give a little bit of your experiences around um, this nutrition piece, which I think can be really valuable for, for those coming behind, for those younger rowers and, and their families as well, because you've probably experienced it from, from both ends in terms of not being able to maybe feel enough or learning from 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 maybe what hasn't happened in the past as well. So I have a couple of questions and if you had, um, we'd love to hear your kind of experiences from that. And the first one was, how has nutrition impacted um, your training and performance? So far, probably more negative than positive. Um, I think I've been working with you now for a while, Sharon, and you've seen that I get the odd wee rib in, sort of stress or I get the odd like low body weight or low body fat and I think it actually like negatively impacts me a lot because I just don't have the time to get in the right amount or maybe I do have the time but I get it in, in the wrong way or when you're trying to train obviously in an endurance sport with high intensity stuff as well like Rowan's obviously sprint endurance so you've got both sides of it you want to have an empty stomach or you want to have a stomach that's not feeling heavy so you can perform to the intensity and the demands that's required and um, but then you also want to have enough fuel to get you through those sessions as well you know if you're doing 28 kilometers on the water which is nearly three hours from the time you push off the dock to three hours to you're back on with all the stops and the water breaks and stuff in between you don't really want to eat that much in between because you don't want things sitting in your stomach and then you don't want to like not bring enough because you don't want to be running on steam either so you kind of have to hit that your body is so resilient though that it probably will let you run on steam for so long then the problem is is like you have to replace that emptiness and then you're playing catch up and then all of a sudden three days later you get a cold you get a sniffle or you're immunocompromised or you get a little stomach bug or you know just you don't realize it at the time because you think you're strong enough to make it through and your body will bounce back but you don't really actually like fully understand the demands you're putting on yourself nutritionally and how that's going to affect it. So I'd say nutrition, I've probably not had the best relationship with it over the last few years. I eat a lot, like, and people who, like, sort of interact with me in social media stuff see that I eat, like, a tub of Ben and Jerry's a day and I eat all this nonsense in the evenings. But I backload a lot of my food in the day because you'd be so busy and so active during the day that I'm trying to play sort of, like, catch up in the evenings. And it's probably not the best way to do it, but it's the only way that I that I that I know how to keep my body comfortable and able to perform at that level. So I actually think that nutrition has impacted me the wrong way, but because I'm using it the wrong way so far. So if you were to kind of 
share any learnings from your point of view with the rowers and, and their parents? What would they be from your own experiences? Or if you were to go back to that junior age group, what are the kind of key things that you think that they would benefit from? Getting like basic nutrition, like like a, a high fat Greek yogurt with like a lot of like honey or something in it or jam, you know, something to replenish that carbon protein. Uh, like I think really quick, but that inter intercession nutrition is where you can really increase the value of the session and increase the recovery time and decrease the stress load on your body. And um, like, oh, obviously, yes, you want your body to be under stress because it has to adapt and, 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 and change to improve for the next session. But I feel like that, that is something I could have definitely done better as, as, a, as a, well, I never really was a younger rower, but you know, as a, when I first started out, I definitely could have better managed my intercession nutrition to come out the other end of it to perform better in the next one. Because I feel like I was training lots back then, but I wasn't performing lots. Whereas now I'm performing a lot more and probably training well when I'm down Cork full time, like training a lot more, but I'm tr training like a higher quality um, and recovering at a higher quality. But each session, then you're able to push and push and push, and that's how you get the improvement. And would you say that was a bit of a light bulb moment, or are there other areas that you felt that kind of definitely you wouldn't compromise on? For me, it's very difficult because I don't, I don't like the compromise and that gut feel. I think that's just for Rowan because it's such a, a huge excess of calories. Like you're trying to get me to do eight thousand plus a day, and I think I tracked it for a while while I was away on camp, and I was like hitting seven thousand five hundred, eight thousand maybe one of the seven days, and like going to bed rolling over like a big cat, you know, with a full belly after a curdle of milk just passed out. But I, like it's. It kind of was a light bulb moment to show me what I'm doing wrong. I don't think I've fully got it right, if that makes sense since. And I actually think, Phil, one of the one of the difficulties is just the size of the unit that you are. That's that's a limiting factor as well, because it is so much because of your height and your weight, you know, that that you you're almost at the very top of the spectrum for that as well. But I wouldn't even be the bit like some obviously there's some rowers out there that are 110, 115 kilos and nearly six and a, like six, eight, six, nine. So whenever myself and Ronan walk around boat parks, like we're the little lads, you small know, units. yeah, we're the small boys. But to be fair, we would be some of the leaner rowers that would be out there. You know, a lot of them would sit a bit heavier and stuff and they would have a lot more reserve and body fat. But I think for me, the light bulb moment was just learning that like you can fuel during the session. Yeah. And I suppose just in terms of um, one of the messages, I think, for the rowers is that piece around eating more. Was there any fears around that for yourself, um, just in terms of some of those volumes of food? Like what would the first thoughts have been or are there any barriers or limits, limitations, do you think, for, for people to be told that they need to eat a lot more, maybe given some of the messages that are out there in social media and beyond? Yeah, hugely. Like, I think whenever I'm, you know, got a little bit less fat on me and look a bit leaner that I'm fitter, but it's actually probably not the case. Um, but like everybody likes to look lean and fit. Everybody likes to look like, but those, those fellas that are doing, you know, a bit of core on Instagram or, you know, starving themselves on two salads a day and, you know, taking super greens as a powder. Whereas you have to realize as a, as like a rower or an endurance athlete, I actually look, like leaner and fuller muscled when I eat more and train hard like when you're doing that volume of training obviously when your volume of training comes down you need to adjust the the volume of food but you don't need to go from feast to famine you just need to make sure that there's a steady energy flow it's the same thing as like I said that you know that same old fuel in a car yep thing like you you can't let it run to empty because you're you're running the risk of stalling out before you get to the next petrol station. So you might as well always keep it in a nice neutral zone. And when you really need to perform, fill the tank up to the top and get ready to go. But when you and when you don't need to drive 400 miles, you don't need to fill the tank right to the top. You know, just keep it in that nice steady middle. And um, so you have enough if you need it, but you don't have too little if, if you need it. So I feel like um social media out there just is horrific for people you know body image and all that like luckily i actually sit very lean ronan sits a lot leaner than me and has a 
a lot better body shape. And sometimes I look at him and he's a wee bit leaner than me, and I'm like, oh, he's in good shape at the minute. He must be really fit. And then you know, he beats me that day in the air, or I beat him that day in the air. I'm just like, it doesn't actually matter what you look like; it's how you perform. And yeah. it's just the, the hardest thing you probably have with me is that I'm like, you're like, it's winter. You need to put on a few pounds, a few wee bit of fat percentage here to prevent prevent illness and all the rest. And in my head, I know I need to do that, but also I'm like, I don't want to walk around feeling pudgy and stodgy but at the same time you just you need to just do that if you want to be able to recover and training in in four degrees outside is very different to training in 24 degrees outside like your body you think oh just because it's cold your body your metabolism isn't running as fast but you're you're using a lot more energy to heat your body up rather than cool it down like if you like you open a window in a house to let the heat out that's easy but you take four or five hours of a radiator to heat the place up you know it's a lot easier to cool something down and warm it up so you actually need you don't realize that difference in energy requirement but it's sort of um yeah that i'm not very good at it to be honest i've, I've been sort of learning a bit but it, it, it's, it's you have to just get it out of your head that it's not about how you look it's if, if you really want to be a performance athlete or if you really want to get to that elite level or even like a really high club level or anything you really need to learn that you need to put in what you want to put out. And if you want to put out more energy, you need to put in more energy. Good stuff. Well, I think that kind of sits very well with maybe some of the sessions that some of the rowers might be doing over the weekend where they're, you know, maybe doing back to backs on a Saturday and then again on a Sunday but they're maybe eating the same as what they've eaten Monday to Friday. And that 400 miles in the car versus down the road, I think it's a really good analogy for kind of prepping you for those back-to-back -back sessions and just high workload. Otherwise, come Monday, you're punctured, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Like well, listen, your, body so is not, <coughs> your body is not this magical thing that just regenerates. No. You have to give it the building blocks. Yeah, and I think it's... It kind of if if you don't look after it, it'll tell you all about it and it will deal with your behavior a little bit. And I think that's where the sickness and injury comes in a bit, because when you when you're either sick or injured, you have to reduce the load. 100%. Listen, Phil, thank you very much for your time and um, some really good, useful points there for everybody that's listening. So thank you. Hi Lydia, um, thank you very much for giving us um, your time this evening and um, we're just really going to kind of give our um, uh, webinar delegates a little bit of a feel for I suppose your experiences from um, what you've learned over the last couple of years and I think it's always hindsight's 2020 isn't it and oh, um, I suppose given the age range of, of those that are here today. There's maybe things that you've learned um, that you can pass on to um, those rowers and their parents. So what I'm gonna maybe um, start off with is, how do you feel nutrition has impacted on your training and performance, if at all? um yeah so i think like i think like you obviously need nutrition to fuel and to be able to perform at your best um i think prior to 2018-19 when i was on like the international team i didn't really understand and i took for granted how important fueling and nutrition was um and it wasn't until kind of getting injured and things like that that you realize like how important it is for you to look after your body and like you only have one body and you really need to kind of look after it to be able to perform at your best um like it took me a lot of mistakes and a lot of a lot of mishaps to kind of figure it out but i think now that i have and there's probably a few things i wish i knew that when i was younger um but i think the biggest thing like in nutrition is like like your food is your friend and like the more you can eat and the more you can kind of you know the more you can take in and the good quality foods you can take in like it's really gonna make all your sessions enjoyable and you're not going to be tired throughout the sessions you're going to enjoy them and be able to perform and it's from those performances that you kind of get confident and you feel happy about yourself so I think to be able to be a good athlete you need to be able to like do good nutrition 
like there's three parts of being an athlete the first part is like the training but it's like what do you do outside of training that makes a difference everybody's doing the same training everybody in the world does the same training but it's the people that recover the best and the people that rest the best that will kind of outshine over other people so and that comes from your, your nutrition when you by eating the, the right foods and good nutrition you'll be able to sleep properly and you'll be recovered for the next day and do you know i think it has a huge huge impact to your capabilities as an athlete i love that bit food is your friend yeah, definitely. it's not the enemy i think that's the no. key thing we want to get across from here yeah. today um can you share any learnings for the juniors and their parents is from your own experiences yeah i think like i think it's it's not like it's not it's not rocket science it's very very simple and i think the more simple you keep it a lot easier it'll be for you to manage I think the biggest thing is to be patient and to be consistent with everything that you do as an athlete. So you need to be like really patient and give yourself time to develop and you need to be consistent. So there's no point being really good one week and eating a load of good food one week. It's You have to do it consistently over 52 weeks to see the benefits of it. So I think being patient and being consistent is a big thing. And I think you don't need to spend a lot of money on supplements, but if you eat like good food and good quality food, if you eat the right times of the day, if you're eating within the 30 minute recovery window after a training session, if you're kind of eating during the session and you know you're getting good food in during like it's not about after the session you need to be able to fuel during it to stop yourself getting into that hole where you need to try and get out of it um i think especially when you're kind of a busy a busy student so in college or in school like a big thing i find is smoothies are a great are a great aid to any kind of busy athlete so you can pile a lot of stuff into a smoothie you can put in oats porridge you can put in berries yogurt if it's summertime put in an ice cream put in nuts like and you get so much good calories and good quality food in there and you know it's very easy to take after a training session or if you're just finishing school and you're rushing to the rowing club you can just have your smoothie in the car and you'll feel really fresh and recovered and ready to train for that session and do you find that that helps would you ever find that you feel sick after really heavy sessions you know that you could actually throw up i de i think that de you definitely would especially if you're so like I used, I find like if we're doing like high intensity pieces, especially I, I could never eat a lot of food. Do you know, I, I hate having a lot of food in my tummy if we're doing like race pieces because, do you know, you feel kind of sluggish, but you kind of have to you kind of have to learn what, what food is good for you. And say if we're doing race pieces, I wouldn't eat a lot of breakfast. I might only have a few slices of toast, but I make sure that after that session, I'm recovering to make up for the not as much food I had in the morning. So I think the main thing is that you if you're if you're struggling to eat enough food like you need to try and find the right windows of the day to eat enough food to make up for it so if you find it hard to eat a lot of food around training that's okay but in the evening or the night time then that's your time to fuel up again for the next day so i think you have to learn to adapt your body to what suits you best and to what suits your lifestyle best but you just have to make sure that you're getting enough in all the time and how would you describe the volume of food that you have to consume and what are the limiting factors to really doing that? Yeah, so I think I think especially as a lightweight athlete, people would assume that we don't eat very much and we're very small and very skinny and we're just little fairies around the place. But, you know, I think today in today's training sessions, I've earned over 3000 calories. So for me to be able to perform tomorrow, I need to replace those 3000 calories. And I also need to take in more to be able to absorb all the training I've done. So I think a big thing is like the volume is, you have to eat is quite a lot. So it's the way that you adapt to eating that. So for instance, today, like I had two big smoothies today full of loads of stuff because they're great calories and I'll probably have another protein shake or I'll have porridge with protein before I go to bed because that's a great like absorption overnight that I can absorb all the training I've done today. But I think the biggest limiting factors for getting good quality food in is probably time. Um, it's hard to eat as much and also maybe coming down to weight in the light as a lightweight in the summer can also be a limiting factor as well. But I think the biggest thing to be able to attack these limitations is to prepare your food early. So say I work two days a week, Monday and a Tuesday in a legal office from nine to five. And then I train before I work and I train after work. So what I do on a Sunday is I cook when I cook my dinner, I cook three chicken fillets with bacon wrapped around it. And I, I put it in a big bowl with mashed up apple and mayonnaise, walnuts and everything. I prepare all that on the Sunday. So I have it ready for Monday and Tuesday. And then I take a bag of microwavable rice with me. So for my big lunch, I have like a dinner. But like the only reason I can do that is because I'm prepared the day before for the week ahead. So I think the biggest thing in general, like if you're a busy athlete, even with school and assignments and everything, like time management is key. And to be able to have less stress on yourself and to use all the time you have 
to recover, you need to be really, really prepared. And what, what in terms of, did you have any fears when we were going through just the changes in the amount of volume? Was there any kind of fear around that for you or you were happy to accept it? I think, especially at the start, I was very, I was very afraid of it because I think I was quite, quite, when I first started like working with Wrong Ireland on the high performance team, I was a very young athlete and I was very, very inexperienced. Um, and I think in my head, like a lightweight athlete was supposed to be 57 kilos all your time, really skinny, really small. I need to be at weight all the time. What if I can't make weight in the summer and not be able to race? And there was all this other things going on in my head. But it wasn't until I learned that like, no, like every, every body shape is different and every athlete is different. So a good example of this would be I'm 168 centimeters and so is Margaret Perman. But if you saw us standing apart, you think I was taller. But that's only because I have longer legs than Max. But then if we were in the boat together, I look smaller than her because I have a really like short torso and she looks a lot taller than me. So like every body shape is different and every person is different. And it's like what you can do to be the strongest and to be the best you can be on race day is what's most important. And if me being heavier in the winter to allow me to do all the training I need to be lighter in the summer, to allow me to win races, then I'm obviously going to adapt and to try and do it. And what do you think was your light bulb moment or did you have one or was it just a... Um, yeah, I, th I think there's been a few light bulb moments. I think every every season is a learning curve and even now I'm still learning how to sweat down properly and I'm still making mistakes, you know, all the time. But I think the biggest light bulb would be in 20, 29, the winter of 2019, I broke my rib on a training camp and I think that was, at the time I didn't understand what it was from, I just thought it was wear and tear or whatever, but it wasn't until... I learned the road to recovery that it all came from my nutrition so going to that training camp I was too skinny number one I was too light I was too lean and I wasn't in it my body wasn't in a healthy place to allow me to do all the training I was doing and then by doing that training my body was weaker I got sick and then because of that I broke my rib but it wasn't until after and I learned that in order for me to recover from this I need to put on a lot a lot of weight because like like as I said earlier food is your friend and to be able to heal your body you need to eat the right foods to to kind of to, it's like it's like little bandages you know your food is there to like kind of hold all your muscles together and it like you need to eat dairy for your calcium for your bones and everything so like you know food is like the best medicine you can have to make yourself as fresh and to like kind of keep you injury free and illness free and you know you don't want to put your body in a vulnerable position so that you're stuck with an injury you're on the bike for 10 weeks you're missing time in the water and then you're trying to play catch up so I think the biggest thing I've learned is just you need to just if your body's in the best possible place it can be like the world is your oyster you just have to allow it to be there build up your overdraft so you can use it <laughs> at the later stage <laughs> yeah lydia thank you very much i think we've taken a load from that and hopefully um uh, there's points there that'll be relevant to somebody and something else will be relevant to somebody else so thank you very much yeah. thanks very much Sharon. thanks for having me not at all So I think I, I'm hoping, whoops, we'll, we'll come back and move it around a bit. Oh, not sure why we're not getting that. Um, we had a couple of other questions and I think we probably have a few minutes as well if there was any questions um, on top of that. But I think in terms of snacking, you can see there's lots of options out there. You know, some of the soaked oats, uh, rice cakes are useful. Um, cream cheese, rice cakes can work quite nicely as well. Popcorn is also quite good. It could be on certain circumstances. It can be things like, um, uh, you know, jellies and stuff like that. Fruit is fantastic. Pasta um, salads are quite good. Rice salads, etc. Um, what can you eat after a missed dinner due to a training session? What I would suggest on, on the days that you're training late in the evening, I would like to try and see your biggest meal of the day earlier in the day. And what you do then is you look at smaller, two or three smaller meals kind of around that training session. So it could be toast before you go out. It could be beans on toast when you come back and then a meal replacement just after. How do you manage the changes in energy needed between training? Um, so again, it's looking at that week it's looking at what you're doing um, and it's really looking at the pressure points in your week as well um, in terms of looking at in season, 
off season and then as people step back from you know real competitive um, work as well um what foods would satisfy for longer after training what you have to remember is we need to make sure number one and satisfy you to to cut that hunger if you're feeling it but what we also want to do is make sure that we hit the energy requirements as well so it may be that it's things like uh, beans on toast it could be soup and sandwiches after again if it's a cold night coming in um, so it, it depends also on what you've eaten earlier in the day that's why it's really important potentially maybe to shift that main meal of the day earlier in the day so that you have actually got a significant amount of food coming in so that you're really just topping up and covering the cost um, of it um, later on as well what we've looked at is hopefully giving you some ideas about things that you could use. So um, hopefully we've addressed some of those practical issues there as well. Um, my 13 year old would eat all the time. I think the reality is that a 13 year old could be going through a growth spurt. So the requirements are going to be really, really important. And actually some of those school lunches need to be massive, you know, so two rounds of bread is not going to cut the mustard, especially if they've done a training session in the morning or they're going to do PE or they're going to row directly afterwards or they're playing another sport. So we may have triple deckers. We may have some soup in with them with a flask or some of these smaller flasks that are really useful that you could bring stew or some other kind of hot, add in pasta to your soup as well to give it a bit more um, substance as well. Um, again. Lydia really talked very nicely about that. Look at the bigger picture. Look at seeing your lightweight making weight as a longer term process rather than reacting to it four or five weeks before um, you come into trying to make weight. So it's a, a process really as well. Um, is it OK for um, teenagers to take protein supplements if they don't eat meat? What I would be saying actually is the priority is probably iron if they're not eating meat rather than protein, to be honest. If they're eating other foods such as um, dairy, cheese, milk, eggs particularly, very useful. Remember, eggs are excellent, easy and quick, good source of protein, good source of other nutrients and good source of things like iron and zinc as well. So try and get eggs in there for things like breakfasts, um, you know, having things like... Um, even things like egg fried rice, where you've done it yourself, you can add in extra nutrition there as well. How could you help someone who is purposely limiting their food intake? Well, I suppose one of the questions I would be asking is why are they doing that? Um, what do they hope to gain out of it? Um, and I suppose using examples like we have here and, and hopefully some of those videos will help you, um, you know, uh, educate that individual as well. But, you know, if performance is their outcome, limiting food is not going to be the answer. Um, they may need further help a little bit along with that. But again, sometimes using examples from here will help as well. Um, absolutely. Um, if you're not eating enough, your mood's going to be affected. Your sleep is going to be affected. You won't sleep well. Um, and actually your weight in a negative way can be affected as well. So um, absolutely, it's going to not only be a health issue, but very much a performance issue as well. Um, your strategy for hydration is going to be different in summer and winter. Um, but remember, if you're, you know, completely, if you've got wearing layers, hats, gloves, whatever, you can be sweating quite significantly and losing quite a lot of fluid. You may need to look at um, a different strategy by adding a little bit of carbohydrate, either in the form of juice um, or some electrolytes into that as well. Um, but again, Remember, some people get cramp in the summer and the reality, the cramp is actually probably to do with dehydration, causing you to use carbohydrate much quicker. And the reality is that will really help, will significantly cause more cramp. Um, lots of people have, you know, sugar is an issue. I fully understand that for the general public. Um, just be mindful that you know, carbohydrate is a lot more than sugar. We can get it in a variety of other ways as well. But again, from a point of view of running or rowing, um, carbohydrate is a really important um, fuel of choice. Um, when is enough 
enough when it comes to training um well if you're getting injured a lot and you're getting sick a lot and you're underperforming and things aren't going the right way there's a problem something's not going right so you really do need to look at address that as well um how can you influence the behavior of a coach who influences um body composition changes the reality is um lots of coaches lots of performance support individuals do come into this space with baggage of their own um they may have been put through behaviors which aren't appropriate um we have to try and educate them we have to try and educate um uh, the the system we have to try and show them that actually um limiting food and also looking at the way you achieve body composition changes is really important for the individual. Um, you know, I would seek support in that if you're having difficulties. Um, and again, we can achieve positive physical changes. And more importantly, what I would say is positive health and performance changes, irrespective of body composition. Um, it can help but it's only one part of the overall strategy. Um, so hopefully um, some of those messages um, are, are important. So really um, we will send out a, a survey after tonight and we would really value your input really in that because it helps us evaluate what was useful and what wasn't um, so useful. Um, so I suppose really in terms of Leanne, was there any other questions that came in there um, that we might we have probably a couple of minutes before we have to go um, yeah we have um, first off thanks Sharon that's great There's so much information in there um, we've got a couple of questions come through as you've been going through um, so one here it's a, quite a long one um, both athletes mentioned eating more to go through winter to get through winter training and um, sitting at a higher body weight to help with injury prevention what I want to ask is, do they consciously change their diet coming into the regatta season to lose that winter weight? Or is it natural to keep eating eating up and the change in training and temperature will do that anyway? Yeah, it's a combination of both. The change in training where there's probably an increase in the training load coming into, certainly they are, well, you know, number one, they've come off a, uh, um, a summer training program so there's going to be an element of um, weight change or body composition changes coming into probably Christmas time um, that's fine and the reality is um, the aim would be to to try and hold that and then look at really periodizing um, the, the nutrition to suit the training program and actually as the training load goes up if you can stay healthy not get sick and commit to each of those training sessions 100%, then what actually that does is that then works the body composition downwards. And if you're doing that wholeheartedly and you grasp the nettle, actually what some athletes struggle with is keeping their weight up. Phil actually mentioned it. You know, he talked about how actually when he comes in to regatta season, he can actually be really really quite lean and that's a problem because then we actually have to step things up another bit as well yeah definitely i don't think anybody really um naturally changes their eating habits as you're saying most people stick in a routine it, it's quite um against uh our habits and our intuition to change what we're eating um yeah. Another one coming in through this. So could you explain a little bit more about the link between muscular injury and an imbalanced diet? Yeah, um, I suppose what tends to happen is um, fatigue will will come in there. Um, you know, you're not able to carry out the training load the way that you want to do it. Um, and just the whole element of things, it just it causes the body to actually close down a little bit so you know the the fuel is not getting in there um to the muscle to do the work and the work is being expected off it and actually then that can cause the stress or it can cause the niggle or it can cause that muscle injury as well so it's a combination of lots of different factors there um but we do see those niggles increasing a lot more in those individuals that are, are more under fueled um and again um they're potentially under recovered as well so that recovery piece is very much linked around um the the muscles 
um, being well enough fueled to do the work that it's been expected to do as well. Okay. Um, another question here. So it can be easy enough to gauge the calories needed to cover training, but referring back to the graph that you went through on one of your slides, um, how do you estimate the calorie requirements to cover the rest of what you're doing? So outside of your training sessions? Yes, so I suppose that's a really good question. Very difficult to estimate, you know, because again, you have to take in some of the non-training activities in there as well. So if you've got a young family and you're running after them for two or three hours in the evening, if you're cycling to work, if you're doing other things, you need to factor that in there as well. Um, the reality is that is that can be hard you know at a very crude way um you know some of us have watches and things like that that will give us a bit of an idea of what our basic requirements are and then we add that on top of it that would be a way i would start i would actually start with looking at your big ticket periods during the week where you might be training in the evening time and the morning time and really look at that period of time and trying to feel that and then possibly stepping back into a more structured you know breakfast lunch and dinner with a couple of snacks on the days that you're not doing as much but remember look at your bookends look at the days before you do those big blocks of training and look at the day afterwards because they can help in those days which are very very busy and you're not really um i suppose you don't have the time maybe to get the full amount in there as well okay. um maybe we have time for for one more one more yeah yep yeah. okay um quite a topical one and um, someone was asking that they've um recently had covid and they're looking at getting back into their training is there anything that you would recommend them to look out for or maybe include um, specifically that they haven't been already? I think it's just about being sure that you're able to, um, you know, to do the sessions, taking it easy. Um, the return to there's a, a, some protocols floating around there for return to training post COVID as well. Um, give yourself time. I think that's the crucial thing. Don't expect an awful lot. And actually, sometimes less is more um, in the weeks and maybe even months after COVID as well, because I think it does take more out of people than than they would even anticipate. And even if they're not particularly unwell with COVID, I think there is a period of time afterwards. And the system has gone through um, something um, significant, just like cold or flu, you know, there would be a period of time that you shouldn't go hell for leather, you know, after that COVID time. So, um, you know, take it easy, make sure that you're feeling well, don't be trying to achieve any, um, you know, personal best or anything like that in a period of time afterwards and listen to your body I think you know make sure you're getting good sleep make sure you're eating well um, make sure you're resting at other times don't try and do everything all at once brilliant brilliant advice um you could take a deep breath now Sharon I think <laughs> I think we're going to start with the questions now we've got the thanks rolling in from everybody there was some amazing um, information in there there's so much for everybody to take away um, we will send out the um, recording and we'll have it up on the website as well so people can go back and watch it again or share it with people. Um, but there's, there's so much in there that you managed to cram into <laughs> an hour and a half. Um, yeah, like there is a lot of stuff. Some of it will not be useful for everybody. Some people will forget things maybe go back and watch it and, and see if there's anything of any. But I do feel that some of the points... Um, everybody's different that's the key thing and remember that context yeah of course and um, we will have and um, the other webinar that you mentioned as well is up on our website the one that's uh, particular to females and, and the menstrual cycle and um, so that will be referenced up on there as well we'll send the link out for anyone who has the interest in that and also the link coming out for the survey as well and um, anyone who's um, sat here tonight and watched it anyone who watches it online watches it back fill in the survey it's only a couple of minutes it just gives us really good feedback on on what we're doing and what we can do better and what else you'd like to see um, so I'm going to wrap it up then for this evening um, I think we're all ready for bed I don't know about everyone else <laughs> 